We're going to believe for your miracle. I want to minister a word that I believe will help stir your faith and help to bring some clarity as to why the healing miracle may not have manifested yet. And then, toward the end, I want to pray with you. And I believe that the tangible touch of the Holy Spirit's power can touch you wherever you are. I believe that that healing virtue can flow and make you completely whole. I believe that whatever your sickness, whatever your disease, whatever's causing your pain can be miraculously and instantly healed. Jesus still heals. Jesus is still alive. Jesus still has compassion for the sick. I want you to lift your hands and say, I expect a miracle. You watching online, comment it now, whether you're watching live or in the replay. I expect a miracle. Holy Spirit, we thank you for that power now flowing. Now let me start by saying this so that there's no misunderstanding. God is sovereign. He can heal anything in anyone at any time. God is sovereign. And I think that sometimes if we're not careful, we begin to treat God as if he's a vending machine. And then we become angry with him if we don't receive the results when and how we want them. Especially when the healing miracle doesn't manifest right away. We say things like, Lord, what happened? I had faith. What went wrong? Why aren't you doing it? And we almost have this entitlement to where we focus our frustrations on him and in this we have to learn to trust him now I know talking about when healing doesn't happen might not be the most faith stirring way to begin a service where I'm talking about your healing miracle but here's the fact of the matter if we don't honor God's word if we don't honor who he is How can we expect that his power will flow? And so I want to first help you understand the reality of the sovereignty of God as it has to do with healing. Now the Bible does give us certain reasons as to why a healing may be blocked. The Bible does speak on what can block that healing virtue from flowing in your life. I'm going to show you those from scripture tonight. But before we get into those... We need to talk about what happens after you've done everything the scripture says to do and the miracle doesn't manifest like you think it should. One of my heroes in the faith, I've talked about several times, was a man by the name of Steve Romine. Steve Romine was a man who moved very accurately in the word of knowledge. Several of the team here remembers him. He would come to our church and do three-night revivals he would begin to call out sickness in people. Not guessing, not trying to fill out the room. I'm talking just pointing at someone and saying, this is what's wrong with your body. He would speak specifically to the issue and then he would say something like, the Lord wants to heal you now and they would be healed. Now here's the thing about Steve Romine. Steve Romine ministered this wonderful healing ministry from a wheelchair. Evangelist Steve Romine had MS. The muscles on his body were deteriorating. And even in his sickness, he was used of God to bring healing to those who needed it. He would often talk about how he rejoiced in seeing other people receive their miracles because it gave him faith for his. He wasn't angry with God, even though he couldn't walk. He wasn't frustrated with the Lord's timing even though he could barely eat and drink on his own. And his body would become tired after only two hours of ministry. We'd have to call an end to the service, get him back for the next night. I'm sure he had his moments, as he would share with me sometimes. But for the most part, in that man, I saw faith and joy and life and the spiritual vibrancy that comes 
from being rooted in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so he would often talk about that day he'd be healed. I was there in his home as he rested in his bed days away from death. And as I watched him, he was not really aware of his physical surroundings. He wasn't responding to us. He wasn't, he wasn't having conversation with us. Even when we talked to him, it didn't seem as though he could really even hear us. And I remember him just lying in the bed, staring at something on the ceiling. It was as if he was looking into the realm of the supernatural. And he was praying in tongues, worshiping the Lord, even on his deathbed. And I said, Lord, that's how I want my faith to be. Because I would rather go my whole life believing for the miracle than to give up a day too soon and not receive what God had intended for me to receive. Now, Steve Romine is made whole. He's walking with the Lord. He's talking again. I'm sure he's sharing a few jokes with the Lord too. He had a real strange sense of humor. I'll probably share more on that another time. Some of you know I've shared it before. He is perfectly whole in his body now. So when we talk about healing, we have to remember that we're talking about an effect that the power of the Holy Spirit has on a temporary physical being. Well, think about the fact that everyone who Jesus healed in the New Testament Gospels is now either in heaven or in hell. Every blind person, every deaf person, every crippled person who was unable to walk, every single one of them now are in eternity. And whatever happened with their physical being, it happened, they enjoyed that miracle for the time that they had on earth, and then they stepped into eternity. And so we have to look at healing from the perspective of eternity. Now again, I'm going to share with you those four things in the Bible that can block a healing. But it's very important that you understand tonight that I am not giving you a formula on how to be healed. If I had that formula, there would never be another sick person who left here sick. But even standing here now, I have to be open and honest with you. There are people sometimes who leave our meetings not healed. Again, this may not be the best way to begin a healing service. But I want to put this in the right perspective. Because if it's not placed in its right perspective, it will be very difficult to receive the kind of faith that actually manifests the healing. So it's not like we say, God, I had faith, now do your part. It's, God, I have faith in what you're able to do, and I trust you with whatever it is you want to do. Some might say, Brother David, are you saying that sickness is God's will? No. I'm saying that I don't always understand the timing of God. Look at what the scripture says here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Don't drink only water. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, don't drink only water. You ought to drink a little wine for the sake of your stomach because you are sick so often. I look at this verse, I say, why didn't Paul the apostle just lay hands on him? Now here, some believers mistakenly say, well, this is because the gifts at this point had ceased. But no, the record of church history does not reflect that, not even close. So that would be to force a presupposition on the text. Some would say, well, what happened then? I thought the apostles had the ability to wield the power of God. Well, as you look through scripture, you'll see men and women who got anointed, who got used. You can go back to Moses, who God used to demonstrate amazing miracles. You can look at Samson, who had physical strength given to him by the Spirit. You can look at all of the prophets. Think of Elijah who called down fire from heaven. And you see the demonstration of the power of God through their lives. But let's be clear about how they worked. 
These men did not wield the power of God under their own strength. They did not control that divine virtue under their own will. They moved under the sovereign hand of God as God assigned those miracles to them. This is why I say that the gift of healing is more of a series of assignments than it is an ability that you wield on your own. And so we see it here. Paul is saying to Timothy, why don't you have a little wine for your stomach's sake? Now, this is not saying that we should drink alcohol. The Bible condemns drunkenness. Amen. Okay, so that's not what he's saying. He's talking about medicinal use. Think of Epaphrodites. Go to Philippians 2. Let me show you something else. Philippians 2, verses 25 through 30. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphrodites back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you. And he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. Here again, we see another example of someone not being healed until God's timing. Now, how should we approach this? I believe that every person you pray over, you should pray with them as if the miracle is right then and there. Every time I pray for someone who is sick, I'm praying with the faith for them to be healed right there in that moment. On one side, we say the miracle is going to happen. God is going to heal you. Expect the miracle. Get your hopes up. Believe in the promises of God. Yet on the other side of that, if the manifestation does not occur like we thought it should, we don't leave with disappointment about what didn't happen. We leave with hope knowing that if the miracle didn't happen today, surely it will happen tomorrow. And then when that day comes, you believe in that day. The mercies of God are new every morning. Why shouldn't our faith be new every morning? We persist, Matthew 7, 7. Ask, seek, knock when you pray. Persistently ask. Why do we pray persistently if God is sovereign? It's not as though we're forcing him to move. We pray persistently because it conforms us to the will of God. And in being conformed to the will of God ourselves, often we are positioned to receive that healing touch. Keep praying. Keep asking. Be hopeful. Even when the miracle doesn't manifest in the way that we thought it should, we move forward knowing that God is still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or even imagine. We know that that name is above every sickness, it's above every cancer, it's above every deformity, it's above every ailment and pain. We place our faith in God. So if you have faith in God, have faith in God. Your reaction to a miracle that didn't occur is actually a demonstration to you of what your faith was in. Because if we truly trust him, then even when the results are not what we think they should be, our response will always be hope and not despair. And if we despair when the thing does not occur like we imagined it should, then that's demonstration that our faith was in the system. Our faith was in a protocol or a method. Our faith was in our faith when our faith should have been in God. And if our faith be in God, we should trust him with every result. Think of the man at gate beautiful in Acts chapter 3 verses 2 through 8. The scripture says that he was there every single day since he was a boy. Since birth he was sick. You know that he wasn't healed until that narrative in the book of Acts. Yet the Bible says he was at the gate called beautiful every single day. Do you know who passed that gate quite often? Jesus. So here you have to see the fact that Jesus is walking by the gate beautiful. He likely heard Jesus coming by. And the rumblings of the crowd that followed behind him. 
He likely heard the shouts off in the distance of those who were being healed. He probably heard the shrieks of those being delivered by the power of God from demonic beings. Yet he never experienced his miracle until God sent the apostles timing. John chapter 5 verse 6. This is in reference to Jesus ministering healing to the man at the pool of Bethesda. And by the way, when he went to the pool of Bethesda, he only healed that man. I don't know about you, but if I was by that pool, and I've been there for days and days, some of them years, waiting for those waters to be stirred, and I saw Jesus go and touch that man, and he walked out healed, and as he left, I would say, wait, where are you going? People often ask, well, if you believe in healing, why don't you go to hospitals? First of all, we do go to hospitals. We publicize everything on Facebook. Second of all, Jesus didn't go to hospitals. The sick came to him. Whether or not you go to hospitals isn't a demonstration of whether or not there's genuine miracles happening in the ministry. But Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda, heals one man, and leaves. Look at what the Bible says here in John 5, 6. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time. Look at what it says there, how it words. I'll read it again. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for what? A long time. He asked him, would you like to get well? So not only was there something in the timing, but there was something in the willingness of the man to be healed. I've had people reject healing prayer because they didn't want to lose insurance claims. I've had people get healed in our services, refuse to go get checked by their doctor because they didn't want to go back to work. I'm serious. They, 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 they no longer need the, the crutches or the brace. Perfectly whole. Not another day of pain. And that's for years. I said, why don't you go back, get me the report? They're like, well, I need the, the, you know, I don't want to really go back now. And they have all these excuses. Would you like to get well? I remember praying for several people at a service in Chicago. And I'm going down the line praying for different people who need healing. And I see a lady seated on the front row. She has her walker. Mind you, she insisted on sitting in the front row. So I'm thinking she probably wants prayer. I found out she just wanted to cause a scene. I asked her, can we believe for your miracle? Very loudly and dramatically, no. Instead of focusing on me, why don't you pray over these people? Maybe God will give them a miracle. I don't want him to waste it on me. I was younger, so a little, little less polished. I said, lady, God's not running out of miracles. She got so mad at me. I thought she was going to throw that walker at me. She got so mad, she, she, she turned red in the face and she stormed out of that place. I'm thinking, you're coming to a healing service, sitting on the front row with your walker for everyone to see, and you don't want prayer? That's a whole different subject, of course, why some people, in fact, I'm writing on it in a new book I'm working on, that some people can't get free because of their addiction to the drama of the bondage. Whole different message for a whole different day. So, So, in looking at the scripture, we see several examples where the healing miracle didn't manifest like the people thought it should. I mean, think about Lazarus. Please, Lord, come. Please heal him. Please help him. He waited until he died and then said, okay, I'm on my way. So I say all that to preface it. Yes, we are going to talk about faith-stirring truths. Yes, we are going to talk about healing. Yes, we are going to talk about expectation and, and persisting in the miraculous. But I want all of that to be considered against the backdrop of God's sovereignty so that Whatever God decides to do, and I believe he'll heal you tonight. Whatever God decides to do, that it's always hopefulness. Because sometimes what happens is people, they're not ready to receive their miracle. They just don't know it. I know that sounds cruel, and it sounds like I'm blaming the sick. No, 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 no. People will be healed tonight. But there are some who are not quite at the place of faith, which is one of the keys. Let's get into this now so that I don't over-explain without proper explanation. Now, first of all, there are three reasons as to why God will heal. Number one is covenant. 
Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. Psalm 107, 20. Psalm 103, 3, covenant. God heals because of the covenant. It's number one. It was purchased on the cross. Now, I know there are those who will debate that idea, but after looking into the matter myself, I am thoroughly convinced that healing is in the covenant. Number two. He heals because of compassion. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Those of you, by the way, who want to be in the healing ministry and God has anointed you to take a message of healing to the nations of the world, I'll tell you this, compassion is a key to longevity in the healing ministry. That's what I tell the guys all the time. Jeremy... Steve, Ishmael, Tim, Britton, don't forget what I'm saying here. Sergio, all you guys. Because we do this, we travel, we minister, it can become a system if we're not careful. And if you don't have compassion for the sick, you stop seeing people and you start seeing crowds. You, you, you stop seeing stories and you start just seeing crowds, nameless, faceless people. You guys, it's, it's the only way to last in the healing ministry is compassion because your heart, your heart becomes hard. By the way, compassion also drives you to become closer to the Lord because you know that sometimes the healing doesn't manifest because you're not living to the same standard. You want apostolic power? You need apostolic lifestyle. God, I want you to heal through me just like you healed through Jesus. Okay, you got to walk in that kind of perfection. The closer we get to his standard, the greater the miracles will be. And compassion drives you there. Lest you become complacent and say, well, I'm satisfied. It's working. Things are happening. The ministry is growing. We'll just stay here. No, there's always greater to see. So number one is covenant. Number two is compassion. Number three is the commission. That's where he sends them to go. Mark 16, 15 through 18. Very clearly we see that laid out there. That those who believe will lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Mark 16, 20. I love this. And the disciples went everywhere and preached. And the Lord worked through them. Confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. So the Lord will cause the miraculous to confirm the message of the gospel. And it's not just healing, it's other miracles, deliverance. You see a demon come out of your relative, that's going to do something to you. I remember we were ministering, I used to hold these uh, healing revivals at my school on lunch break. And I remember I was ministering and there was a kid there, I believe in his particular situation, there were many miracles, so if I'm overlapping some stories... All the miracles happened, but there was one in particular. I think this was the instance where his psoriasis had begun to clear up right in front of his face. His skin disease, that redness, patchiness, the flakiness, his skin began to become smooth right as we began to worship right there. And so he's telling his friends, look, 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 my hand, my hand, my hand. It's, it's, and you're, we, we are watching it as it's becoming smooth skin. It's a creative miracle. And I remember standing behind me, I overheard someone who was telling everyone behind me, this is fake, it's power of suggestion, or he's acting. And I remember I turned to address him like this. I remember I had my hand up. I said, I went to explain, no, it's the power of God. When I turned like this, I felt something like jolt out of my hand, like an electric shock. It hit him. He fell on the floor Like he landed on a pile of bricks. He's not going to fake that. He landed on like a little pile of bricks. And he gets up. He goes, this isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real. (laughs) You guys, he was in church that week. He gave his life to the Lord and was radically transformed by the power of God. (laughs) Now, this isn't always the case because the gospel itself is miraculous. That God could save a soul. That's miraculous enough. But God does, from time to time, cause the gospel message to be accompanied by demonstrations of power. Now, I'm not saying that if you haven't experienced a miracle 
uh, or you didn't experience a miracle like that at the time of your conversion, that it's not real. But I'm saying that in some cases, God will use his powerful demonstrations to coincide with the communication of the gospel. So number one is covenant. Number two is compassion. Number three is commission. Now let's look at blockages. Number one, demonic power. I'm going to show you in the scripture. Luke 13, 11 through 13. Watch this. He saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. Well, that's it right there. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her and instantly she could stand straight how she praised God. Now let me balance this point by making it very clear that though sickness can be caused by demons, not every sickness is a demon. Do you know how you know if a sickness or if a sickness is rooted in demonic power? Here's how you know if a sickness is rooted in demonic power. When you rebuke it, it goes. Simple. And a lot of people get tormented by the idea, especially if they have a lingering sickness. And especially because the effects of sickness can be so devastating, we get it in our minds, this is a spirit, it won't leave me, I've had it prayed over. And they're attributing to the devil what is actually a natural occurrence in the material world, the sickness. It's also important that we do not confuse sickness for demonic ownership of your physical body. I'll explain it like this. If demons want to affect the believer physically, they have to do it in one of two ways. One, they have to use a demoniac to harm the believer. You've seen this like, for example, with some of the, I, I got to be careful about the way I say this because censorship on the internet, they, they listen in. And if I say certain phrases, they censor it. But you've probably seen this, you know, like when you watch on the news and all of the kids are running out of the schools, the cops are all there. Those instances, okay, those people in very many cases are demon-possessed. You may think that's hyperbole. You may think I'm being dramatic. No, 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 no. In those instances, those people are possessed. Guys, you can see it in their eyes when they're, when, they're, when they're being interviewed. There's one recently. It was just the sentencing was supposed to happen today, but I think they moved some things over till Tuesday with, with the Parkland shooter, they called him. I was watching clips of this. Guys, I, before the Holy Spirit, I saw demons in his eyes. Like legitimately demonically influenced that guy. That is a spirit. Now, in order to harm the believer, a demonic power must use a demoniac. That's number one. Remember, they can use two things. And how do I know this? You see it in Scripture. Well, who do you think, who do you think persecuted the martyrs? You think those rulers and those governments and those powers that took the lives of God's elect, you think those people weren't demonically influenced? That's demonic. And so we as believers know that the body isn't the final state, but it's a very sad thing to watch. So the, if the enemy wants to harm a believer physically, the, the demon can't literally touch your physical body. Now, I have teachings on this. We can go into this in depth later. Someone may say, well, what about this? What about that? I promise you anything you're going to bring up, we've covered. And I don't say that like in, in a condescending way. I say that to encourage you. It's all covered. And we, we talk about it in my spiritual warfare playlist on YouTube. But... That influence that comes over that demoniac gives it power in the material world to use that demoniac's body, and then that demoniac brings physical harm to the believer. The second way that demonic beings can attack the believer physically is through sickness. Now, the demon doesn't have to attach itself to you to send a sickness your way. We see this with Job. Where the Lord, when the Lord removed the hedge of protection, the devil was not able to grab Job physically. He wasn't able to go himself and, and touch the physical body of Job. No, when, when Satan had the ability and was given permission by God to go and bring a physical attack against Job, he sent boils. In other words, he sent a sickness. Okay? So it can be demonic. 
But again, if it's demonic, it's the easiest one to deal with. Because if it's rooted in demonic power, then the moment you use the authority of Christ to rebuke that demonic power, that sickness has to lift. It has to. And if it lingers, you do like Jesus said. You go fast and pray, come back and do it again. And if it still remains after that, it's not demonic. It can't be. When you rebuke a demonic being in the name of Jesus, when you rebuke a demonic being using that authority, it's the Holy Spirit himself acting on your behalf. And so, demons can cause sickness. Now, again, we don't want to be dismissive and just say, oh, it can't be a demon, it's not harming. No, 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 it could be physically. That demon using a sickness. You rebuke it, doesn't go, rebuke it again after prayer and fasting. Why? That's the only recourse Jesus gives us against stubborn demons, prayer and fasting. And if afterwards that demonic being does not go or that sickness does not go, then it could not have possibly been demonic because we know, biblically speaking, that if it is demonic, it has to respond to the authority of Christ. So that's number one. I listed it first because it's the easiest one to deal with. Number two, disobedience. Now, again, let's balance this. Sin can cause sickness. The Bible talks about bitterness rotting the bones. But I don't think it's like some... It's, it's not as... I don't want to use the word... What's the word I'm looking for? There's a very clear reason as to why this works, I should say. Because in sin, there are consequences. You live a lifestyle of drunkenness... That's going to do some damage to your liver. You live a lifestyle of gluttony. That's going to do some damage to your heart. It got real quiet in here. Sin causes sickness. Disobedience causes sickness. Not all sickness is the result of sin, as I'll show you from Scripture in a moment. But sin causes sickness. Watch this. John 9, verses 1 through 3. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or the sins of his parents? Verse 3, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. That's Jesus talking. Jesus answered, This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. So, sickness can cause sin, but not all sickness is caused by sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me show you an example of disobedience bringing sickness to the body in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 27 through 30. So, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For, verse 29, For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. Guys, that's New Testament. Now, some could say, but Brother David, in context, Paul the Apostle is writing about the communion. Yes, that is the context of what Paul is saying. But the takeaway principle that has universal application is the fact that disobedience is what caused them to become sick. Now, this obviously freaks some people out because they say, well, I'm not going to take communion now because I don't know what that means. Well, if you look at the context, Paul is very clearly saying that their sin was what? Not discerning the body of the Lord. And what did he talk about before that? He talked about division. So, to take communion, an act of unity, one with the Lord, one with each other, and to be at odds with your brother or sister in Christ, that's what caused them sickness. It was, it was division that was causing them sickness. It was hate for each other that was causing them sickness. That's just a consequence of sin, not even just always in the spiritual realm, but it can actually be a practical manifestation of the feelings that your thoughts produce. Think about the fact that you can be sick to your stomach when you think about certain people. 
Think about the fact that, that you, can, you can go about your day, you can be happy, you can be joyful, you get one phone call and suddenly you have a headache. You feel weight on you. That is a physiological response to the pattern of your thoughts. And your thoughts can be sinful. This is why I say that there's a practical manifestation to this as well, not just a spiritual element. If we carry bitterness, if we carry jealousy, if we carry fear, anxiety, angst, and we're walking around with all of these negative emotions, yes, the Bible talks about these, then that is going to produce also a physiological effect, which brings the body into the state of sickness. Your anxiety keeps you up, you lose your sleep, your immune system begins to lose its power, and therefore you take on sickness, not as a direct result of the fear, but as an indirect consequence of allowing yourself to have thoughts running through your mind unchecked. Bitterness, unforgiveness, jealousy. Oh, you ever feel that? You're scrolling, you think your life is great till you see someone else's life that looks better and just it hits. I mean, it's easy to be unified, right? Until God gives someone something you've been praying for. And then, man. Sickness. It got quiet in here again. So number one is demons. Number two is disobedience. Number three is doubt. Now, here I have to be very clear. Just because someone isn't healed doesn't mean that they weren't healed because of their doubt. There are people who've had faith for a healing that did not receive it. No one can tell me Paul the Apostle didn't have faith for his healing even though his eyesight began to dim, many scholars believe. I think it had something to do with his original encounter, where he was blinded. Could have been the effects, the physical effects of the glory. You say, how can that be? God is loving. Well, think about, um, I think it was uh, in, in the Old Testament where uh, the, the, the oxen upset the cart. Oh, what was his name? Uzziah or someone like that. And, and he goes to catch the, the, the ark, I don't know, I just taught on this, the name escape. But anyway, he goes, to, he goes to catch the ark and he's killed instantly. That wasn't very loving or kind. No, it was just a natural consequence. But that's a digression. So Paul had trouble with his eyesight. You don't think he had faith for his healing? Timothy had trouble with his stomach. You don't think he had faith for his healing? So let's be clear. You can have faith for a healing and it's still not manifest in that way. But, but we have to be sure it's not doubt. Now, in order to do this, we have to have and allow for self-examination. Many times preachers are accused of blaming the sick. How many stories you hear? I went to a preacher. I didn't get healed. He says it because I didn't have faith. And they're just, they're huffing and they're offended. And how could it be? And people come along on the online community. Oh, brother. Oh, sister. We feel so sorry for you. Here's our pity. Be energized by it. And they're just taking on all the pity and everyone feels sorry for them. And, but I'm thinking, well, was it doubt? I mean, could it have been doubt? Think about the defensiveness that comes up when people start talking about faith and doubt. And you say, do you have faith for Of course I have faith for my healing. Are you sure it's a doubt? No, I believe God. Bless God. I'm blessed and highly favored. Of course. Okay, okay, okay. Let's, let's lower the defenses. And let's allow for some serious self-examination. I'm a person, I'm a prayer warrior. I'm, I'm moving the prophetic. I've been in ministry. Okay. You can be a saint floating into the room on a cloud of glory. But let's do some self-examination here. I'm not saying everyone's issue is doubt. But I'm saying let's at least have the humility to consider the possibility lest we miss our miracle because of spiritual pride. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verses 4, 5, and 6, Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Mark 5.34, Luke 17.19, Luke 18.42, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. 
Now, of course, that's the general rule. There are exceptions. Where was the faith of Jairus' daughter? She was dead. Where was the faith of the centurion's servant? He didn't even know he was going to be healed in that moment. He just, imagine, he's sick and just all of a sudden, hey, I'm, what happened? Where was his faith? Where was the faith of Lazarus? Where was the faith of the man who was lowered into the room through the roof to be before Jesus and receive his healing miracle? The Bible says Jesus saw their faith, the faith of those who brought him. So again, all of these things must be considered against the backdrop of God's sovereignty. God can heal anyone he wants, anytime for any reason. I was ministering in Southern California. And I'm moving down the prayer line. And there's these two people standing next to each other. One was a teenage boy. And one was a middle-aged woman. This woman was blind. I think it was either her whole life or since she was a little girl. We're talking decades of blindness. The boy that was brought up was walked up by his mom. She held him by the wrist and helped guide him to the platform. I prayed for the woman first. She felt the power of God go through her. And she began to see shadows and lights. She had not seen those in decades. But the miracle didn't fully manifest, like in Mark chapter 8. didn't fully manifest right away. And so we kept believing, and then I felt led to move on and pray for the next person. I said, let's keep praying for her, but I'm going to pray for the next person now. I go and I get the story. I ask the mom, what happened? She tells me that her son snuck out of the house, went to a party. He was in a place where he should not have been with people he should not have been connected to. And one of his so-called friends put something in his drink. And it caused him to go nearly blind. He was legally blind. He could barely see a thing. It just it was, it was a horrific story. I prayed for him. And after a few times praying, his eyes... Opened completely. Someone ran and got a small print Bible, put it in front. He started reading that, no problem. He starts weeping, gives his life to the Lord right there. I left that service, and here I'm going to show you some of my humanity here. I left that service, and I was so mad at God. I said, Lord, because I couldn't get the woman's face out of my head. She's looking, I mean, she was believing. She was, I could see it. There was sincerity on her. I said, Lord, why did, why, why did you heal that boy and not that woman? Now, here's where my religious side came out, okay? I'm going to be very vulnerable with you right now. Very religiously, I said, she deserved a healing. He didn't. Yeah, I know. Some of you felt the fear of the Lord just hearing that story. <laughs> and I was so upset. I was like, Lord, like. And then I said, why did you even need me to pray for either of them if you knew who you were going to heal anyway? And these are things I was working through in my heart. Lord, help me, help me, help me. And the Lord told me a couple of things. First of all, he made it clear to me that he loved that woman more than I did. I said, okay. And then he said, your job is to pray. My job is to heal. Leave it at that. And so we look to the word for answers. The Bible makes it clear that when there is faith in the heart, a miracle can manifest. When faith is stirred, that miracle can be received. Now, this doesn't make God a vending machine. As I said, he's sovereign. But in our faith, we bring ourselves into availability. With our faith, we position ourselves in the posture of trust and say, Lord, I believe you can. I trust you will. The results are yours. But the Bible makes it clear that faith is one of the components of receiving your healing. 
Now, I know that doesn't sound kind or compassionate in some instances. I know it can sound like I may be trying to blame other people for not receiving their miracle, but we have to consider this. Finally, number four, and I won't spend too much more time on this. We're going to minister the healing. And as I said, I want to pray for your healing too. Number four is deception. And that is to misunderstand what the Bible teaches on healing. Psalm 103.3 very clearly says, Who forgives all your sins and heals all your disease. So this is a two-sided coin. On one side, let's believe for your healing now. On the other side, let's trust God. Will you all trust God? Let's, let's, let's approach now our sovereign God with sincere cries of faith, repenting of wrongdoing, rebuking and taking authority over every demonic power, making ourselves available to him. You know, I've watched prayer lines with people. <laughs> that, 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 I, I, I sometimes feel like I could do a lot of really interesting studies in psychology, just in the many different positions I've been in with lots of people. But I watch people sometimes while I'm praying. And you'll see me calling people out up on the stage. Come, come, come. I'm looking for two things when I lay hands on people. One, I'm looking for a manifestation of power resting on them. It's not always physically visible, but it's there. And two, I'm looking if they're looking at me. If they're watching me, I move right on. And I've watched people come and believe for their miracle. And I've seen those with hands lifted, staring at me like this. Watching me across the platform. I very rarely have ever seen them healed. Because they're so worked up. Some people are so worked up that God can't minister to them. Because they're so wrapped up in just how desperate they are that, that they're, they're, they're leaving no room for faith. They're not approaching in faith, they're approaching in fear. And then I've seen those, even with some of the most severe sicknesses and diseases, hands lifted, eyes closed, tears streaming down their face, they're just thinking about Jesus. And they come out of the wheelchair. Their tumor goes away. God heals them. Now again, all these things are mysteries. I can give you glimpses through the scripture at the working of God's healing power. I can give you glimpses of truths. But ultimately, there's no method to miracles. It's a simple positioning of yourself. Repent of all sin, yes. Get that right. Rebuke any demonic power that may have tried to attack you. And then accept, believe the truth that that demonic power has to obey the moment you say that. Has to. It has to. And then just begin to look to the... I sense the anointing so strong right now. And then just begin to look to the Lord. And receive that healing touch. How do you receive? You, you forget about the sickness. You forget about the need for the miracle. And you focus on Him. Tonight I laid a foundation with the teaching from the Word of God. Something solid that you can grasp and take with you. Something that shifts our perspective to seeing healing through the correct lens. We need faith. We need to repent of sin. We need to come against demonic power. We need to understand the truth. And most importantly, we need to trust God's sovereignty. All those things considered, the scripture instructs us, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You know, the Bible tells us and I love the way the King James Version words this. That they brought the sick to Jesus. And the Bible says, no matter their sickness, as many as touched him were made whole. I've seen God's power move, church. I watched the face of a little girl, deaf in one ear, light up when the, the moment she received her healing miracle. Her mother brought her to me after the service. A little girl, 
a little uneasy, a little uncomfortable with the situation. You know moms sometimes pray for my child. And there she was, just nervous, not really sure of what to expect. And the, the moment I looked at her, I could see the Lord was going to do it. I can't explain that to you. I can't explain that to you. Don't even ask me. It's a mystery. I just saw this one's going to happen. I placed my hand on her, and she jumped like this because there was like an electric shock that went through her body. And then I started to test her ears. Her face, she looked, she looked just like someone, I don't know, startled her or scared her. She was shocked. Her eyes got real big. She began to look around. Her ear opened completely. The mother the next month brought us the doctor's report. In fact, the medical experts were so confounded that they ran test after test after test after test said this cannot be because this test shows that she's hearing out of this ear and she should not be hearing out of this ear. A woman came in, unable to walk without assistance. You remember this one. Issue were there too. She comes into the service, people reported, barely able to move. Each step looked as if she was about to fall over. People had to help her into her seat, and she sat there in the service the entire time. She comes screaming up, the end of the service, I'm praying for the people. Mass of people at the stage, believing for God to touch them. And a woman begins to scream at me. Please, please, I need healing. Please, I'm in pain. Please, I'm in it. Over every voice I heard her. Sergio, you remember that. They brought her to the stage, and when they sat her on the steps, she wasn't even able to sit up straight. Her her legs and back were so, so badly damaged. Guys, I'm praying for her, and it wasn't God's slaying power. She fell off the stage. She falls off the stage and begins to scream even more. She's, she's, she's lying on her back trying to, to move. She, she can't. And, and she's saying, it's been years. I can't walk. I can't walk. I'm in so much pain. And then she begins to cry out, I'm deformed. I'm deformed. I'm deformed. I'm deformed. And again, there was a moment of faith, a cry out to the healer, Jesus. And then we began to pray for that woman. And As that woman's lying there on the floor, she begins to kick her legs up. She begins to roll just a little bit. And we felt like a rush of God's power come down onto this woman. You guys, by the end of that service, she's running around the building, screaming, I can walk, I can walk, I can walk. What was that? It was God's healing power. Church, I've seen tumors disappear. Deaf ears open, blind eyes open. There was one woman who knew she was healed because her eyes got blurry when she was wearing her glasses. And it wasn't until she took them off that she realized she was completely healed. There was a little girl who came to a service. Her, her, her knees were crooked. She was born with crooked legs. Hobbled to that service. It was so packed Her and her mother could get nowhere near the front. They were in the back of the back, right by the foyer. We had people packed into the foyer. There were people sitting on the grass outside. We placed the speakers. There were people in their cars listening to the service. And this girl was way in the back. And here's what she told her mom. She said, it's okay, mom. Jesus can touch me back here too. That night, she did not receive her healing at that service. But on the car ride home, As they're driving, the mother felt a little disappointed. She felt bad for her daughter, wondering if maybe maybe the Lord would do it another time. As they're driving home, that little girl says, Mom, do you hear that? Mom said, No, I don't hear that. She said, Something sounds like it's popping like popcorn. And when they got home, 
that little girl's legs were perfectly straight. It's God's healing power. You know what I love about miracles? Miracles need no explanation. Miracles need no argument. I've seen people with skin disorders so severe that that there was redness and patchiness and flakiness and that skin be completely restored. People with sexually transmitted diseases completely healed. Not a trace of it in their system. I've watched as the Lord has delivered drug addicts of the most severe kinds of drug addictions, leaving with no cravings, never to touch drugs again. Some of them in ministry today. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. I was praying for a man who had a stroke. His left side was paralyzed. I believe it was 12 years that he hadn't walked. 12 years. He's sitting in his wheelchair. His wife had rolled him up to the front before the preaching even started. And just as I was getting ready to send them away and tell them I'll pray for him during the prayer portion of the service, the Holy Spirit said, you pray for him now. We prayed that man for the first time in over a decade began to walk. His movement completely restored. There's a video online of a woman in Orlando. I think you were there for that one too. You get front row at all these. One side of her body, her hand, withered, drawn in, hobbled, used a cane. When she was greeting people in the front, she would greet them with the other hand because she was only able to stretch this one out in a certain way or a certain length. The Holy Spirit, as I'm preaching... God is my witness as I'm preaching. I begin to hear myself say, where's that woman from the lobby? God wants to heal her right now. I said, did I just say that? I can't explain that to you. And they bring this woman down to the front and right in front of everyone, she drops her cane, begins to raise her leg and stretch out her hand. And she began to dance around that venue. I, I got to find it. We have it on our channel. And that woman began to rejoice. Her miracle done. That's the healing power of God. Church, I can tell you miracle after miracle, story after story. Tonight is your night for your story, for your miracle. Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Stand to your feet all across this room. You watching online. Believe for your healing too. I want you to begin to write it in the comment section. Write what you're believing God to do for you. You could even put names of your loved ones, names of family members who you're believing for healing. Even if they're at the verge of death, I believe God can raise them and restore their physical bodies. I believe that with all my heart. There's no formula. If there's anything we've learned tonight, there's no formula. There's no method. There's nothing special that we can do. It's simply approaching Father God in the name of Jesus and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. Let your healing virtue flow through my body. And I believe tonight many will be made whole. But what I want you to do for the next few moments is just lift your hands. And I want you to begin to be lost in this worship. I want you to detach from this world as we ascend to higher places. And as we worship, you online included, the healing virtue is going to flow. We're going to sing hallelujah, a simple chorus. And as we sing this simple chorus, I want you to focus your mind on Jesus. When Jesus becomes more real to you than your sickness, you'll be healed. When Jesus becomes more real to you than your sickness, you will be healed. Expect it, believe it, receive it tonight. As we put our faith in the word of God, in the promises that he has declared, you forgive all our sins, you heal all our diseases. We come to you now, healer, healer, healer. 
Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Ancient of Days, the Resurrected Lord, we come before you now and we throw ourselves on your sovereign compassion and mercy. We thank you that every sickness and every disease has to bow to the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that as we focus on you in this moment, that you by your Holy Spirit would lean in, press in, and make your people whole. Hands lifted, eyes closed all across this room voices and sing hallelujah and lift it up. Seated at God's right hand. See him now, church. With the eyes of your heart behold him as you sing. Singing with the angels now, church. As heaven invades earth, the miracles are happening. Just focus on him now. our faith in you. See him seated at God's right hand as you sing. He sits upon a throne. Eyes like fire. Lightning flashes before him. Radiating with the glory of God. The resurrected Lord. The very same who walked the shores of Galilee. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Look to Him now. Look to Him now as you sing. He's looking at you. His eyes of fire. He looks at you. And that love and that light and that peace and that joy fill your being. We honor you, Jesus. Even now that healing virtue is flowing. Even now that healing virtue is flowing, 
Lift your voice and sing again. Hallelujah. Look to Jesus now. Hallelujah. These are praises that we sing to Him. is opening over this place. Hallelujah. Receive your miracle in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Be made whole in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Some power is flowing through this room. Sing it to him. Hallelujah. Oh no, robo bo center yente robo bo. Miracles are happening all over this room. Miracles are happening all over the world as you watch. Receive this power from on high. Place your hand on your sickness right now. Wherever you're sick in body, I want you to place your hand on that sickness right now. If you have a pain in your head, put your hand on your head. If there's a problem with your leg, put your hand on your leg. You watching online, do this too. I don't care if it's the replay. That tangible touch of his power is still here. I'm telling you, it's like electricity on this room right now. Place your hand. On your sickness. This is your first act of faith. This is your first act of faith. Father, I thank you for every miracle that you're performing. By faith, Lord, I stir up the gift that you've placed on my life. By faith, I stir up the gift that belongs to you. And I, your servants, who you know and love, Join my faith with your people. And in the name of Jesus, I rebuke every sickness and every disease. It has to go. In the name of Jesus, cancer, go. Blood disorder, go. Arthritis, go. Tumors, go. Skin disease, go. Blindness, go. Deafness, go. Paralysis, go. I command bones to be set straight. I command muscles to be healed. I command nerves to come back online in the name of Jesus. Let feeling and movement be restored. Receive this now, church. Just begin to pray out loud. Come on. You watching, do the same. Just pray out loud and receive this. In the name of Jesus, that healing virtue now begins to flow across this room. I rebuke that power of the enemy over your life. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and sickness is a work of the devil. We bind every sickness now. We declare the healing power of God to flow through this room and across that camera. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Receive that healing now. Some of you are beginning to sense like a warmth come on your body. Others are sensing like an electricity moving up and down. Others feel like a weight or like a wind. Still some are simply feeling the pain going away. I want you now, act number two, 
your second step of faith, I want you right now, whether you're standing in this room, whether you're watching live or you're watching on the replay, I want you to begin to exercise your faith. Examine yourself now. Examine yourself. See if the miracle isn't done. You in this room, if there was a pain in your body, I want you to begin to move that part of your body. You in this room, if there was something that caused you pain or that caused you to be immobile, I want you to begin to test that now. That's your second act of faith, you in this room. I want you to test your eyes and test your ears. Look for the tumor, check for the skin disease. Check yourself now, examine, examine by faith. That is the power of God on you. That is the power of God on you. Now, those of you in this room, if you believe that you've been healed, can you just wave at me like this real big so we can see? Look all over the room, church. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for these miracles? What a wonderful Jesus we serve. You online, if you believe you've been healed, I want you to write that in the comment section. Write your testimony in the comment section. The power is still flowing. The power is still flowing. Don't you dare turn off that stream. Don't you dare turn off the video. That power is still flowing. From start to finish, the anointing is flowing like a river. And I want you to continue to receive from that. Now, if you're in this room and you believe you've been healed, would you do me one more favor? I want you to come and stand over here where they're waving at you. And I want you to come and testify and tell us what Jesus has done for you. Now, I understand that it may be a little bit intimidating, especially being in a room where you probably don't know everybody. But I want to tell you this. Your brothers and sisters are, A, going to rejoice with you for your miracle. And B, whether you think the miracle is big or small, your testimony could be the key to stirring the faith of another who will receive their healing. So come out of your seat now if you believe you've been healed and come stand right over here, please. You can do that now. God bless you. Those of you who waved at me, you can come and stand right here. They're waving you down. God bless you. God bless you. And just help guide them there so that they don't go that way. Yes, bring them this way, this way. What a wonderful, wonderful Jesus we serve. You know what I love about these services is you never know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. You never know what direction we're going to take. Every service is so different, so unique. That's the power of God. The rest of you, you may be seated, but do please keep that posture of reverence toward the presence of God. And Reuben, we're going to be bringing him up onto the platform. Ushers, we're going to be bringing him onto the platform. I'm going to read some comments here online. Um, they're coming in from all around the world. Quickly, quickly, quickly they're coming in. Uh, Marie says, my neck is healed. Larissa, I believe I'm healed. Debbie, I've been healed. Guys, let me know what the Lord is doing specifically. I would love to know the story. Uh, Nima, I believe my son, mom, and brother are healed. Kingdom Lad writes, I am free in Jesus' name. Evie Way writes, I'm delivered. Judy, I feel electricity through my body. Mama Tess writes, I am totally healed by the name of Jesus. Janet, I believe I'm healed. Cards writes, I believe I'm healed. Many comments, I believe I'm healed. I believe I'm healed. Precious writes, I'm healed from back pain. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Pete wrote, yes, my knee stopped hurting. Thank you, Jesus. We give you the glory. Adrian, I am healed. These are miracles, guys, taking place all around the world. Wow. This is what Jesus does. Laura says, my arms are healed. Clara, I believe I'm healed. There are so many testimonies coming in. This is just amazing what's happening. Ruben, what's going on here? And Ruben, we want you on the top of the platform as you're testifying. Okay. What happened? Diga, this is Richard. For about three years now, has had an autoimmune disease. And he says, he took a step of faith through that whole process, stopped taking his medicine, but he said he still had aches and pains that would come and go. And he said for the past week as well, he's had, he said he has back pain and it would be excruciating to the point where if he would wake up, he wouldn't even want to get out of bed. He said this week he was believing for his miracle. He came to service. He said God touched him. He said he has no more back pain. And what was all that pain from again? Please remind me. I, I think it might have been the inflammation. When you have an autoimmune disorder, it kind of messes your whole body up. And it, three years ago, it was just painful. The worst thing ever. Worst thing ever. And what happened tonight when the Lord began to touch you? 
I was sitting over there and uh, I'm just praising God and just believing God for what he promises are. And I gave up my seat. And when I gave up my seat and went to the back, I felt the healing take place in my body. Praise the Lord. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? Hey, guys, if you don't mind, DJ, please join me. And where's Gustavo? Okay, bring, bring them up. DJ, come, please join me. You're going to help catch. I want you... You know what, and, and, and Easton, please, just a distance, please. I'm not being difficult, I promise. There's a flow to this. I want you all to stretch your hands toward this man and pray. Keep praying in the Holy Spirit. Just lift your hands or close your eyes. praying church keep praying you know if, if you're watching and you're wondering what I'm doing the people here know me but but you're watching you're saying what is all this number one I don't give every prophetic word on the microphone as some of the things that I minister are personal and for the people alone and I have to honor that I know it's not good for YouTube but this isn't about YouTube this is about the people receiving and so sometimes I'll go off microphone but you're watching these people fall over like this they're not getting knocked over to be healed that's not how it works some people think oh is that how it works they get up they get knocked over and then they're healed no 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 they're testifying of the miracle that has already occurred they've already been healed that's God's power what you see coming upon their physical body now is one of the manifestations that God do, does through our ministry where there's just this weight that comes on them. They feel the power. It's like they can't stand up and they fall over like that. Some people report feeling electricity. Others feel like a weight, but, but it isn't coming from me. It's not coming from me. It's coming from him. It's not me. It's who's around me on the platform right now. That's why I told our camera guy to, to back up a little because the Lord's presence is very tangible here right now. And I have to honor that. Can you pick him up for a second? What are you feeling on you right now? Yeah. Say again. Heat. Like a heat on your body. That's the power of God. You go rejoicing in your miracles, sir. No, no, that. Sergio, what happened here? Diga, this is Sylvia. For a year, she's been having pain in the ankle, even in her back. And the way she described it, she said she felt the breath of God touch her, and there's no more pain there. And how long had you been dealing with that? I felt the touch on my back. What'd you say? I said, how long, how long had you been dealing with it? About a year. About a year? How bad was it? Well, they put me in physical therapy. And what did you feel when the Lord touched you right now? I felt like a touch back here on my back where my spine is. What did you feel on your back? Like a touch. Like, 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 a, like a hand on your back? Yeah, back here. And I felt his presence. Church, did you hear what she said? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Did you hear what she said? I'm like really excited for you. She felt like a hand on her back. There are miracles happening here. This is the ta this is supernatural, I'm telling you. I've done it before. Where, my back. Yeah, that's the Lord's healing power on you. You said, she's telling me she had pneumonia a couple years back and she felt the same hand touch her. That's... Like, like a hand going up your back. I went, he told me to go to the church and have them pray for me. And I just kept going. And then he told me again, go back and have them pray for you. So I went back to the church and I... And you felt the same hand there. And I went into the sanctuary where the ladies were having prayer meeting. And they prayed for me. And as they were praying, I felt his hand go up my back. That is supernatural. How many want to sense the touch of the Lord like that? Lift your hands. Come on. You're watching online. Lord, I pray that the people would begin to fill you right now. I, I, I really believe that God is going to do it. Go rejoicing in your healing. God bless you. 
Britain, what happened here? David, this is Ashley. For months now, she's been dealing with a pain in her neck. And she said during the worship began to go away. And when you said to lay hands on the part that they needed healing, she laid hands and it was gone. And what did you feel come on you? Just a warmth. It was like a warmth. I'm telling you, he's on the platform with us. Lift your hands. Stretch your hands toward this sister right here. praying in the Holy Spirit church there's something supernatural happening for her right now Lord I pray you cause your people to sense that touch even as they sit in their seats hold your hands out like this you watching online do this too Easton, this way. Nobody move. Everybody stay where they are. Easton. You all pray in the Holy Spirit right now. You're watching from your home right now. I want to show you something. And this is not... You know me. This is not a gimmick. This is not a show. It's a very holy moment right now. I know there are desperate, hurting people watching. How many of you can sense that right now? It's, it's, it's like a, a, such a weight on the room. Hold your hands out in front of you. You watching online, please understand this is so precious to me and this is not a gimmick and, I, and I'm doing this as I'm led. Please understand I'm doing it only as I'm led. Hold your hands out like this. Church, you know me. We're a very balanced, very reverent people. This is the real deal. Many of you heard of revivals past. You don't need to wait. It's happening now. Hold your hands out like this. I want to show you something. I don't care if you're a believer, you're an atheist. You're far from God in your mind. You think you are. I want to show you something. <sighs> Father. As I reverently lift this prayer to you, I pray that your people and those who do not yet know you would receive this power now in whatever way they're able. Let it flow like a river. Lord, even on those critics who are watching this broadcast now, let this power touch their children, Lord, and bless them and give them a bright future in you. There are critics watching now people who are watching looking for things to criticize I don't curse you I bless you in the name of Jesus and I pray God's goodness and mercy would follow you all the days of your life may your children know the same Holy Spirit who's here with me now touch your people some of you are sensing like electricity others are feeling like a weight some like a heat that's the power of God I command, the, the, some of you are watching, you're not even born again, and you've got demons in you. Those demons are coming out now. That sickness is being healed now. I give you the glory, Lord. Don't rush this moment. Just receive, receive, receive. There it is, right there, 
Some of you are sensing that real strong on you right now. That's the power of God. Lord, increase it on these people too. Touch your people. Let that weight come down on the room. Let that weight come down on the room. begin to take your seats. I'm reading the testimonies and the prayer requests as they come in online right now. And so many are sensing that touch of God on their lives. So many are being healed. The Lord tells me that there are many watching who are into new age practices. There's no spirit more powerful than the Holy Spirit. But we don't serve God for power. He redeems us from sin. Saves us from the wrath to come. There are many people in the new age watching this. They're drawn to it because of the power, like Simon the sorcerer was drawn to the apostles. But today I invite you to give your life to Jesus. To trust in Him for your salvation. What does that mean? It means A, to acknowledge you have sinned against God. You have. All of us. And because all of us have sinned against God, we deserve the punishment, the fullness of the penalty for that sin, which is eternity in hell. That is, that is the absolute truth. You say, how could a loving God send people to hell? How could a just and holy God not? It's interesting that when it comes to the sins of others, we demand justice. When it comes to our own sins, we cry out for mercy. There's nothing any of us could ever do to earn salvation. You could stop sinning today, live the rest of your life in perfection, and still fall short of God's standard. Even one wrongdoing, even one sin, violates the holiness of God. And so we turn to Jesus knowing that he lived a sinless life, died upon a cross, taking the wrath of God and giving salvation and forgiveness to those who believe in what he's done. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Believing and believing unto righteousness. When you truly put your faith in him, he gives you a new nature, new desires, sin begins to lose its power in your life. He's speaking to you now. 